I'm still trying to figure it out. So, okay, so next we have what roles do data and addressable media play in your brand marketing strategy? We have Matt Baer for an SVP at Adva for Advanced TV at Cadrian. And then we also have Kelly McGowan. She's an associate media director. And um, I'm sorry, please tell me your agency name. Mullen Low Media Hub. So we're all here um, to welcome them today to the stage so they could um, talk to us about addressable media. Thank you. Sorry, how do you use it? How do you use it? Is <laughs> there we go. Perfect, perfect. So um, the theme here is what role does a data and addressable play in your brand marketing strategy? Because I think we talk a lot about, um, and I sit in the programmatic space, so we think about, in the addressable media space, we think a lot about programmatic, and we talk about programmatic, and we talk about addressable media. But I think the role of this is really to provide context on how this fits in, why it matters, or why it shouldn't matter to your media strategy. Um, so as a matter of introduction, I want to introduce Kelly McGowan, who's, uh, who's a great partner of ours and close, and, uh, close partner of that. Yeah, so I am Kelly McGowan. <coughs> I'm an associate media director over at Mullen Lowe Media Hub, where I um, am on the brand planning side for media. Um, and I work alongside brands such as JetBlue and L.L. Bean. Um, I also sit on a data-driven council over at Mullen, where we're all about using inventive ways um, of harnessing data to drive better business results. Yeah. And I'll also add, she's also a, her side gig is an addressable media expert. Um, <laughs> she knows anybody within the advanced TV programmatic addressable media space, she knows more than anything about A, how to apply it, and B, um, the intricacies of it as well. So, yeah, and I'm Matt Bayer. I work at uh, IPG as well um, on the within Cadrion on the uh, which is the technology unit uh, for IPG media brands, um, focusing on programmatic, addressable, or data-driven um, strategies and approaches. So, <clears throat> how to approach a data-driven campaign? I think first off, um, we're not. We're not calling it programmatic for that very reason. Um, we're talking about how do, how do we approach a data-driven campaign and how do we drive addressability. So I think it's important to, because I think there's a lot of folks who, or there's not consistent um, definition of what addressable media is. Um, Kelly, yeah, would, that's you wanna, a really good segue. would you want to help define Raise it? your hand if you've heard of addressable TV. I think that's a good point of reference. Okay, good. So addressable TV is all about an audience-based buying approach to the big screen, which is a marketer's dream. It's all about finding your audience and messaging down to the household layer. I think traditionally agencies and brands use tools to identify networks and day parts that have high target composition. And then you go and put together a buy to get to a higher, highly target percentage, um, where addressable really favors the audience over the environment. So in this schema, really the environment is not as important because you can cut to the chase and message straight down to the household. Absolutely, and, um, and I guess in that context, so addressability could be at the household level or it could be eliminating waste in some, in, in some form or fashion. Um, Kelly, does the, do the traditional buying approaches, do those kind of go out the window or do, we, or do you still have to think about that in context of your traditional media plan? I'm glad you mentioned that. I think somebody previously was talking about how there's very limited scale with addressable. And um, we are kind of using addressable to plug and play in a, do a lot of different ways. So for instance, on an airways, we are using addressable to get to a target right frequency but we're complementing it with a high impact layer, um, which is a broad reach. Knowing that environment is still very important for this brand. We want to be inside those live sporting events because we want to be the hometown hero in our key markets. So we're using it to complement our reach layer as opposed to planning to the long tail of cable, which we know that the younger end of our target audience is probably less likely to tune in to watch. Yeah, and, and there's a deep analysis of how you're going to market already, and then understanding then how addressable then feeds into 
sort of that holistic approach. So I think in order to navigate this, um, I think it's important to also understand sort of why you should be, I, I think we've answered the question, you know, why addressable? Um, clearly targeting, eliminating weights um, helps, but how does this fit alongside other media tactics? Yeah. How does this impact? Um, I know you talked a lot about reach and frequency, mm -hmm. optimization and management. How do you, how do you think that sort of, uh, how does that play with other, with other media tactics and in the context of your strategy? Yeah. So for a retailer, we leveraged addressable TV to really get to our core loyalists. We've segmented it out using um, a really great first-party data source. And we use addressable to get really a frequency play with the audience that matters, but we complemented it with a native execution online where the goal was to push the brand to, uh, we call it like a cool space. I think a lot of our younger end of the target or the millennials were less inclined to shop us. So we had to borrow some influence um, from these style influencers um, and show them that the product has evolved and it is cool um, and less reliant on our laurels and more about how um, our products are cool. So we kind of complemented it with that very targeted TV um, and long form digital approach. So it's definitely not a one size fits all solution, but it was one of the tactics that we used yeah, in a campaign. Absolutely, and, and it's important to not think about addressable TV and silo because you need to take signals from, you know, we talk here at the conference a lot about content and taking signals from that distributed content and from other paid, owned, and earned channels and understanding then how you tell that holistic story in order to, in order to um, drive as much impact as you can. And I guess that's a, that leads into the next question um, because what do the KPIs look like? I know yeah. um, a lot of those were reach and frequency management, but also, you know, is it sales? Is it is it brand metrics? Is it consideration? I know we talked about the funnel, but everyone wants to get to the bottom of that funnel yeah. um, and understand driving on uh, the how you drive sales. But what do those KPIs sort of look like? So KPIs for us, ultimately, we're using media to drive better business. So our ultimate goal is sales, and we will keep a keen eye to that during um, the campaign and following the campaign. But during the way, there are roadblocks or uh, checkpoints in place that will help us understand if we are, you know, getting to our end um, very well. So, for instance, this guaranteed frequency that Addressable will provide. When you go into market traditionally, you're working with a reach and frequency that is very estimated. And I just think yeah. that that's the way that the, the world's worked for quite a while. But with Addressable TV, we're able to define our audience, define our universe. And so our reach is, uh, it pales in comparison to traditional methods. And then we also have a better gauge on frequency, frequency which is very important, um, managing both of those things, and then hoping that the output is as best as possible. Yeah, and, and that's how I think technology helps sort of manage reach and frequency. So it's not just an estimate, but it's, it's, it's actualized, and, and, it's, uh, and we could take those insights and optimization um, and apply them in, in as, in as real, quote unquote, real time as you possibly can. So I guess to reach these KPIs, so to reach these sort of sales driven KPIs or whether it's a brand metric KPI, I know you talked about uh, focus on business results, sort of what, what data have you, have you seen? And I know we've worked on many campaigns that have <laughs> had a, a plethora of data, um, various data. So what sort of data sets do you see yeah. are the most impactful? So it's all about the right data, not necessarily big data. So, and data is really the crux of this entire execution. So um, in the instance of a retailer, um, they were sitting on a wealth of first party data. They've gotten into the magazine game quite a, a while ago. So we leverage those first, that first party data to segment to our core fan. But in the case of um, another brand, we, uh, they didn't have a centralized location for their first party data. So we worked to identify zip codes that contributed to a higher percentage of ticket sales. And then we worked side your team to layer on an additional filter to get to a leisure traveler, knowing that they were gonna really impact the bottom line more than a business traveler because that wasn't our, our business proposition. Yeah, and, and, and it's really important, I think, you know, we talk a lot about CRM data and leveraging client CRM data, um, but it's also really important, Ada, to really start from a, from a tactical standpoint, not about the actual data set, but what, what do you want the result to be? And yeah. Which customers do you want to influence? Yeah. Um, 
and, and then figure out the best way to, uh, to drive that. And in a lot of cases, it could be your CRM data, but other cases, it could be other sort of modeling approaches, which is why for that specific client, we took that, you know, that secondary approach to amplify their ticket sales segment and their first party data. So um, how do we manage and store this data? I, th I think we talk a lot about it in the industry about, you know, DMPs and leveraging a DMP and, and at times there's not enough focus about the output of the DMP. It's about sort of step one, which is creating that DMP. Do you have, do you have any thoughts from your experiences on, on sort of the output of that DMP and how it's, and, 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 and why it's important? Yeah, I think the DMP, a lot of people think that a DMP can just inform the bottom of the funnel media. And I think this is a great use case of how a DMP can help us message to the top of funnel and then draw in a sequential story across screens, really making sure that the frequency is to the right people and it matters to help us yeah. convert easily and better, a richer conversion, if you will. Yeah. Um, so I think. Uh, with our clients when we talk about how a DMP can help them segment down to a TV plan, that's just like light bulbs go off, like what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and there's so many, because um, from a planning tools perspective, a DMP is so oftentimes siloed from that. Um, yeah. So it's important and critical, I think, as an industry for things like the DMPs and our agency planning tools and client planning tools and client attribution tools to sort of bridge together and we've made some leaps um, to bridge that and we've created sort of data stacks and, and, and intermediary things that could take very disparate data points and signals and targets and attribution to kind of bring them all together so that we could increase impact and, and, and increase learning. Because over time I think um, it's really important I think to, uh, whether it's a business result, to lower the ROI over time. and yeah. and and things like DMP strategy and management and connecting that to all other disparate functions is, is important. So um, what have we learned? So sort of what is, the, what is the, not only from a, we'll get to the best practices standpoint, okay. um, but what do, you, what do you think are the most critical learnings from, a, uh, from just getting a, an addressable television or an addressable media campaign off the ground and getting that data uh, getting A, the KPI straight, B, getting that data organized in, a, in an actionable fashion? Uh, I think the biggest thing I learned was to trust the process. <laughs> so we're really talking about um, a process that crosses over a, just a plethora of disciplines. I mean, when we went into this addressable campaign um, for a retailer, we sent, spent about three three to six months just selling in the process to all the layers over in their organization. And this was because this was kind of a gray area where it wasn't a cut and dry media plan. It was something that we had to make sure that the C-suite felt comfortable with, something that the CRM contact over there felt comfortable with because we were essentially dealing with quite a bit of PII. Um, we have to make sure that we were managing costs internally over at the organization because there are data costs that um, aren't media costs, but um, that need to be discussed with the marketing folks over there. And then we also had to talk to their um, analysts and the measurement company that was gonna help us conduct this econometric model post the campaign. We wanted everyone to feel comfortable with this because this wasn't a one-time campaign. We want this to be something we go to market with um, during, uh, you know, a lot of different Q4 initiatives because it was something that we felt very strongly about. So I think trust the process, but more importantly, know that this conversation is going to be something that puts you in rooms that you probably might not have stepped inside further, like previously, excuse yeah. me. And, um, and it's awesome because it's bringing media to people who probably don't or yeah. wouldn't have touched it prior. Yeah, and media impact and showing how the how uh, all of that all of that great data could be leveraged and organized and segmented properly for for action. So, as far as best practices, um, what would you say outside of timing, outside of management and of of timelines and organizational structure, um, and as from a, and even from a strategy standpoint, sort of what are your what are you thinking about? Um, what are you thinking about moving forward as far as learnings go and, and kind of how this fits into the overall picture moving forward? One of the biggest things, again, kind of learning and best practice is all about the data piece. 
I think people are intimidated like just because my first party data isn't beautiful. It's messy, it's in four or five different places. Um, how can we leverage that? I don't think that um, you should be intimidated by that because I think that there are tech partners that exist that can help you identify your best prospects if this is something that you think is, yeah. is gonna solve your uh, business problems. Yeah, no, that's great. And, um, and I would also add, I think too, is that we're sort of at a point where the data has to get more predictive and it has yeah. to be, you know, if we're, if we're guaranteeing our client a customer, a, a sale and a customer, you know, we need to, whether it's our own data or data that we have to model on our own um, and have to hire outside data scientists and sources, um, we need to do that to, to, drive, uh, to drive a business result. So um, I know I think we're out of time, so to speak, but if there's anybody has any questions, we wanted to make this, uh, we wanted to open up the questions around, or around any of these items we discussed. Okay, well, selfishly, that's great because we are now, we've updated the app. I know we're running a little bit behind, but we've updated the app with timing, so we're, we're now back on time officially. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, well, I'll bring Doug up in a second. We'll actually have time to talk in more detail in the afternoon roundtables about a lot of how this works, the nuts and bolts of, which Matt's one of the discussion leaders on. So. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks guys.